Okay, um, we're always adjusting and playing with things. Um, I feel like I might just do this every day after work, um, 45 minutes for an hour. Just mess with stuff, because otherwise I'm not going to make any progress. Close the basement door so there's less noise. Slightly. Okay, and we are alive. Um, let me tweet out an announcement just so that, you know, people can be aware of it. Oh, uh, let me find the link for this thing. I can never find it. Do, 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 do. Like, I, there's got to be a better way than just going to my channel, but I always just go to my channel. And look at the live stuff. And then just share a link to it. But, like, there's got to be a way right from the studio thing. I don't know. Oh, I might have to rename this in post. Um, because <laughs> this is not season one, episode three. Can I rename this while I am in the middle of streaming? Let's see. update things? I don't know. Who cares? Low effort. That's the name of my game. Wow, it actually updated. Cool. Okay, let me share this on Twitter. Copy link. Twitter time. Dreaming. Gonna try sticking an EEPROM into my NES and see what happens. Twatted. Okie doke. So, yes. Um, is anybody watching? Yeah, I got at least a person watching, so time to get started, methinks. Um, so as you can see, uh, the cartridge actually pretty much works. Um, it's plugged in. It's powered on. It's uh, right there. I'm using my tweezers <laughs> to kind of uh, wedge the cartridge in place just right so that it actually makes proper contact and all of that good stuff. So that's what's going on down there. So uh, the next move is, let's go over here, uh, if I turn this off, so we can all see it's working. So um, <laughs> this actually got a little bit higher. Again, I said I'm going to try and not do too much off stream, but um, another thing that came in yesterday besides the solder wick is um, some El Cheapo sockets. And so I'm going to try and do the old trick where I take a socket and make it kind of an adapter for the EEPROM. Um, so right now I've just got, just to make sure it would actually plug into the uh, socket that I've got on the board, I've got the Mario program ROM. Here you go. The Mario program ROM sitting in a socket in the socket. And that works just in. So, what I'm going to do is try and remove the Mario cart from the, or the Mario mask ROM from this, uh, from this socket. It is very tight. Like it is directly making contact with the top of the plastic, which makes it a little bit sketchy to wedge out of here. 
And then, as I was saying, chip extractors, who needs them? All right, so we got, it's my shit ass internet. Yeah, I would say in, uh, just when I started, he, he said I'm becoming a stream fiend. Um, I think I'm just gonna try and do this a little bit every day after work. Um, and that will be my hobby time for the day, which I would normally have, but I don't normally stream it. And I thought to myself, why not just stream, you know, 45 minutes an hour every day. So when I, when I remember to. Okay, so the next step here is, uh, we have looked at these before. Let's see. Yes. Um, let me zoom in here a bit. So this is, and we've looked at this a couple times, this is the pinout for the actual mask ROM that is on, uh, that I just had in the Mario Kart. Um, and it's pretty close to, let's see, no, that's not the one. I don't know why that was even up. Um, God, these websites. These websites. Let's see if we can just open this image. Copy image. And now zoom in. Okay, so left hand side is the regular EEPROM that I have. Right hand side is the Mario Mask ROM. Um, and I determined last time uh, we should be good putting up with mirroring because I don't have enough address lines on that chip because it is slightly smaller than the Mask ROM. Um, but the only pins that don't quite match are everything on this side up to A15 matches just fine. And then there's a 16, which we do have on both chips, but it is down over here on the mask ROM, which is output enable on the regular EEPROM. So um, basically both these pins I need to lift. Also uh, these right enable and no connect. No connect is a no connect, so it doesn't matter. Right enable is active low. And you can see this is a plus five there, so don't care, shouldn't matter. We can leave those just plugged in. Um, so the only things we have to shift around are the output enable and A16. So I was just gonna solder some jumpers last time, but what I have decided now is since I have some El Cheapo sockets, um, I'm gonna try just making an adapter socket. And I have to think about this real quick. Um, hmm. I guess I could just use some of the wire wrap wire. Let's see, because I need... Hmm. I need output enable on the actual chip itself to always be grounded. Um, hmm. Which is an interesting ask. Um, because I don't actually want that one to touch it, and I want the actual pin to go over to A16. So, hmm, still might be easiest to just lift some pins on the thing. Um, hmm. Sorry, thinking is not very entertaining to watch. Hey, Red Gek. Nice to see you. Um, okay, so. F. How do I, I'm trying to think of, I've watched Adrian on Adrian's Digital Basement do a few of these. And I can't remember quite what his approach is. Because I need to be able to basically disconnect one of, well, both of these legs and move them. Um, can I use, would it make sense to use two sockets on top of each other? Because that way I can bend up pins on one socket and run wires to the other. That might make sense. So, par example. Uh, it's going okay, you know, it's a slow project. Well, it's actually a normal speed project, but you know, uh, 
I'm streaming it, so it's it appears very slow. Um, but we might actually, maybe, hopefully, get some code running this time, or at least get close to it. Um, yes. So, what if I took one of these? Which one is going to be pin six? Or well, the one that is pin sixteen on the mask ROM is pin twenty four. So if this is 17, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Nope, let's count that again. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Let's take that one and bend it out. Yeah, I think this is the way to go. And then my A16 is on pin 2, so I'll just take pin 2 and also bend that out. And now, theoretically, what I can do is, um, let's see, so this guy, uh, you can kind of see it, maybe? Not really, that's weird. Um, because everything is backwards for me. You still can't really see it. I have, there you go, you can see it. I have bent up this pin, and that is the output enable pin, so I should just be able to solder that directly to the ground pin. And then the other one I lifted up, you're just gonna have to trust me because they are, they are tiny looking. Um, there is one, yeah, you can kind of see it. Uh, that is the A16, which, I should be able to just run a wire down to the now unutilized uh, pin in there that the output enable one is not going to. And that should be an adapter. Now, <laughs> the biggest question is going through three freaking layers of sockets. Um, how good is my connection going to be? But I think it will be probably okay. It, it, marginally worse, because it's already not great. Um, so I guess let me do that. Do I have power? Yes, I do. All right, let's move this out of the way temporarily. And while I am doing this and getting ready to solder, let me tell you my story about what I am kind of thinking uh, for proving that I'm running code on the thing. Um, I was thinking, oh, I got to set up. Like, I have to figure out how the PPU works and stuff to get some stuff on screen, but that was foolish thinking because, you know what I can do is uh, write to the controller ports, right? So there is at least one pin on there. Um, there is solder. What I do with my reel of wires? That's a very good question. Probably tossed it over my shoulder the other day and it lit on fire and disappeared. Oh, no, right here. Right behind it. Anyway, um, so there is uh, one output pin which is used to uh, latch the shift register that's in the controller. Um, so I should be able to use that and like toggle it. And if it's toggling the way that I programmed it to be toggled, then it's working, which uh, I could either do like a timing loop Eh, maybe uh, or like just write a loop that waits for one controller to have any of the buttons pressed and toggles the latch signal on the other controller when that happens so that like you know that would be pretty obvious I'd have pretty immediate feedback um, so that's my thought I think that'll be a lot easier than drawing something on the screen um, so anyway let me get this soldered up, which should be hopefully shockingly easy. So first, let me strip a little bit off this wire, and tin. One of these bent up, this is the A16 on the EEPROM. Get a good amount of slot around there. And solder on this 
wire. And hope that it makes a good connection. A mechanically sound connection. So that it doesn't pop off the second that I try moving the wire or running the wire over to the other pin. Also, hopefully my audio is marginally better. I uh, have compression on it now, so that's something. Okay, we'll run this around to where A16 is on the... And my stream is going to connect and disconnect. Nobody's watching TV, nobody's doing nothing. Um, I think I am forced to admit that my internet just blows chunks. So, whatever. Sorry. Okay, now I have to see. So, is that bottom one was 17, and I am going for 24. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. I don't know if it's normal to recount things so often, but uh, I'm ADD, so what you gonna do? And I am going to drop solder directly into the actual socket on that pin and then I am going to attach that A16 wire to it. I don't know if you can see anything. And hope that I connect it in such a way that it does not get in the way of all of the other pins. In fact, you know what, I'm going to put a little bend on this so that I can come in from the side. Okay, that's something. Seems to be in. And then uh, I need to attach the um, output enable to ground because we will always have output enable uh, enabled. I think that makes sense. Um, I assume that's how the mask ROM works. The mask ROM does not have an output enable signal on it. it doesn't have an output enable pin. So I guess. It only yep it's one of those days I don't know what that disconnect reconnect uh, I don't know what that uh, connecting and disconnecting is like on the consumer end I would assume not good yeah this is dumb I will have to complain to my ISP. I mean, could it just be that I am streaming at a, I mean, I'm streaming 1080p, which, I mean, that's not crazy high, but maybe it's just too high for my poor internet connection. Okay, so, I'll try and, because I don't want to solder up this whole leg, because it still needs to go into the bottom socket. just want to attack this at the very top of the ground leg. Okay, that seems like a connection. For better or for worse. Now I need to try and jam these suckers together uh, this way. Make a IC socket sandwich. And all my pins are going every which way, so that's great. Come on. This this works perfectly fine until you start mangling all your pins because you are soldering crap to them. Okay, this one is sticking all the way off. And they bend super easy because it's a cheap, cheap. I see socket. Okay, that seems lined up. Sandwich achieved. 
All right. Uh, is this sufficient? I don't know. But theoretically, this is a EEPROM to MaskROM pinout adapter. Maybe. And hopefully those pins are actually all making contact with each other because there are going to be <laughs> three layers of pins potentially making shit contact with each other. So that's great. Okie dokie. Um, I, I guess that's about it. Like I can throw this into the Mario Kart. Just make sure it's the right way around. Jam it in violently and aggressively. And hope I'm not, you know, breaking the wires that I just soldered up here in the process. Okay, so theoretically, hopefully, I can just plug an EEPROM into that and it will show up in various places in the NES's memory. Um, and of course the fun thing is going to be I have to light up that cart just right and get it plugged in just right uh, or it won't boot at all because I didn't really show that on stream but I mean that's you have to do it with the, with the actual Mario Mask where I'm in there too just because the edge connector is kind of shit uh, so I think it's programming now I think we do a program um, first let me read some chat let me switch to my display there we go. And let me check some chat. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I, I know you weren't on in a couple streams, Red Gek, so audio should be significantly better. <laughs> I've gone through a couple upgrades. Um, <laughs> I can identify with very little working RAM in my brain. Um, oh, I'm surprised and annoyed that you can hear Windows device sounds because my desktop audio should be muted. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I figured. Is well does it is it like give you the spinner? I don't know, it doesn't matter. You lose chunks. That's I pretty much sit there and wait. Um Ah yes, Dirt Piper, what I you told me what you were working on. Uh, which, you know, also congratulations on being done dying. Um because that I've been there recently. It sucks. Um, so good on you. Spinner for 10 seconds, then the window sound. That's pretty much what I assume. Though again, I'm still annoyed that you can hear the window sound because theoretically I muted my desktop audio. But also my actual like Windows audio, I'm looking at it and it shows that the actual Windows audio is also muted and I can hear the noise. So... <laughs> Excuse me. Um... Oh, successfully tested version two of my 6502 single board computer. But now I want to do crazy stuff like this. Uh, crazy stuff like this is the only thing I ever want to do. But friggin' cool on uh, 6502 single board computer. That is always fun. Uh, it makes you feel a little bit like you have some godlike powers because you created something from nothing. Um, <laughs> though I found after you build a single board computer, uh, getting it's, it's all about the journey because once you've built it, uh, you, just, you just have a shitty computer. <laughs> And, uh, I don't know. For me, at least, it loses a little bit of its wonder is the unfortunate thing that I found out. Um, and replacing the cable on my favorite PS2... Oh, I missed. Uh, oh, right, you're, you're the doing the Minecraft thing. Um, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. I can identify with just the... Uh, getting back to my project being the pile of things, uh, which is part of why I want to stream this every day, because this trying to stick to a project is the goal. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, moving on, the plan now, yeah, it's not my keyboard, this desk is just uneven. Uh, I think what I will do, so firstly, let's look at, uh, bah, 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 bah. let's see if I have an actual tab open for this, probably not, because if I need it, I probably don't have it. Let's just look up uh, the controller um, registers. Uh, I know, because they've got pages on the controllers themselves, and they've got pages on, like, the 
console side controller registers. I don't know, maybe they're all on the same side. Uh, one of my worries about um, the idea of having one controller trigger the latch pin on the other controller as a test is uh, I feel like the latch pin may be shared. So let's find that out. Um, yes, that is that is this one. It's controller shift register strobe. Um, so if you write to address 4016... Um, Oh no, okay, so the bottom most bit in the register at 416 is the strobe signal. Um, hmm. So this could be, because I, I want to do this, I want to start with the easiest possible thing, um, <clears throat> which would be like, if I test really quick, let me figure out which pin is the, physically is the strobe pin on here, and then, uh, just test to see normally I got you. normally at power on uh, if it is high or low and then I could just write uh, the opposite from whatever the normal value is to it and then go into a a halt loop that would be the easiest thing to possibly do so I think that so let me first check to see uh, do they have on here what pin is which on the actual controller controller port pinout? There we go. That sounds right. So on the controller, okay, top pin is ground. Um, out is the strobe, I believe. Directions are relative to the jack on the from of the console. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, but yeah, I believe because uh, DO, D4, and D3 are all things you can read on the read register, and then clock is one register, and out is the stroke, and that is the Thank God these are like keyed, because I don't have to care about this note that I don't understand. Of course they're relative to something, but in what way? Um, okay, so it is the one up from the bottom left across from the like chamber. So, let's probe it. Unplug the video because that is in the way. And turn this kind of in a U facing way. Kind of. And maybe move this camera so it's pointing just a little bit further down. Um, and where is that? Hardware scale so meter. Tis here. Alright, so ground was the top pin. And I can just I guess I could just touch the ground plane inside of this thing. And it was this one, right? And set this to DC volts, the lowest range, and turn it on, I guess. And it's on, and that is reading zero. So I suppose that makes sense. I mean, really, it probably starts up in an arbitrary state, uh, realistically. Uh, and let's check which one is 5 volts. It is same side as the little chamfer. First row. Yep, that is 5 volts. Okie doke. So, as I probably could have assumed, strobe. defaults to off when the thing turns on. So, how about we just write a program that writes one to that register and goes into a infinite loop. And hopefully that should be good enough to show us that we're actually running code on here. So I am going to use, um, I don't have a good, uh, not a good assembler on here. Um, 
Sorry, just reading chat. I have not used mag. I, I had one reel of magnet wire and I literally bought it just to. I was actually screwing around and stuff. Um, this is, I tried doing a little coil around a pen cap and it's not nearly enough turns. And that's the only thing that I have ever used magnet wire for. Um, except maybe when I was a kid. I probably did an electromagnet thing when I was a kid that I'd forgotten. Uh, okay. Anyway, I'm going to use. Um, shoot. I can't remember the name of the website, but there's an online assembler. Online, one line. Online 6502 assembler. Virtual 6502 assembler. And again, I'm not quite sure. Like I could, I could work out what the mappings are going to be between this IC and uh, going through the mapper chip and everything. But all I care about is the. There is like a couple K fixed at the highest part of memory, which is where the uh, boot vector for the 6502 is. And that will be because I don't have like the top couple of uh, address lines that are on the mask ROM. Uh, the mask ROM will actually, uh, the EEPROM will be mirrored several times throughout the equivalent space of the mask ROM, but uh, the, a mirror of that highest area will still show up at the right place at the end of uh, the map ROM memory space. So, uh, if I just, you know, put the boot vector at the end of my EEPROM and remember what the kind of relative memory space I'm working in is, it should just kind of work, hopefully. Um, is this the one I'm thinking of? Yes, it is. So, this is a... Uh, how big is this 65 no uh, 29 ee 010 is how big let's go for data sheet it should be okay so it's a 128k chip so um, I have to do quite a bit of buffering stuff. Um, let's see really quick, actually. Can I just do, will it work with this assembler org? Uh, probably dollar sign F, 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 uh, C. And then let's see, what is the syntax for a literal? So I want a, a literal word pointing to wherever I want to start. Uh, bah, 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 bah. I know it's ah oh it's just dot word nice okay dot word um, here let's just go whole hog. Let me zoom in here a little bit too for you. Um, so I'm going to do .org you know, ff. Like I don't need a ton of space, so we can just start at fff. Oh, uh, I'm trying not to run into. I don't know. Let's do ff ao because I only need a couple bytes of instruction here. And I'm going to put a label here. called something uh, entry and we'll put some code there but I just want to see if this builds right and path this out properly so actually no this is incorrect because this would be if I was just in a 16-bit space but I am not that actually complicates this um, will this assembler understand memory addresses beyond uh, the end of 6502 space because of course uh, 16 bits only gets you um, 64k of memory space and this is a 128k chip so I actually need to uh, it's gonna be 128k is double 64k so I think it would just be that right 
let's see. Let's see if this assembles. Assemble. Um, okay. I wonder if it just knocked off. Uh, oh, I will probably need to download the binary, but yeah, it looks like it just knocked off the the top bit. So I might just have to write a quick little program to pad this whole thing by, I guess, 64k. Um, let's download binary. Generate. I don't know. Um, basically, empty.bin. And let me actually make a working folder here. Let's call this. It's just a PC. Nope. It's just a PC. I can use a mouse. NES. Yeah, let's save it here. Basically, I have to dive in. And open containing folder. And size 1K. Uh, what? Um, I don't think I have a hex editor on here, so. Uh, you know, oh, you know what I do have, actually? I downloaded the programming software for the uh, Mini Pro, so that basically has a hex editor built in. Let's just use that. Load file. Binary, yes. Sure, that all seems fine. And documents. It's just a PC. NES, basically empty. So yeah, that would appear to not work. You can't just use org like that. Fine, fine. We're gonna have to write some padding stuff. Um, I wonder if the, the padding uh, preprocessor, preprocessor? Uh, I don't know, directives, if the padding directives will let me actually pad this out to be 128K. Um, why would the NES, does the, the NES doesn't have, like, a BIOS on board, does it? Because, I know, like, an NES ROM image has a header, but I believe, and I thought up to this point, that the, that header is literally just for emulators, because... Um, of course, the NES being weird and having separate character ROM and uh, program ROM and the mapper and whatnot, it needs a header to tell it uh, where everything goes and what mapper emulation to use and whatnot. But um, so, for example, the Genesis actually does have a boot ROM on board, and it will check uh, like the checksum and stuff. I don't know. Let me let me look at this up on NES Dev because it was my assumption, and it's it's gotta be, because this cart uh, is mapping the uh, mask ROM to the end of 6502 memory space, which is where the reset vectors are. So when the thing comes on, whatever is when the 6502 processor starts up, whatever is at the reset vector, which is FFFC and FFFD. Uh, tells it where to start execution. Um, so either I, for the NES would need to have its own onboard ROM that uh, has that that's mapped into that location when the thing starts up in order to do anything at the beginning. So uh, as far as I know, let's look this up, but as far as I know, the NES isn't smart enough the only way to do that and also have uh, that space available to the cartridge would be to, uh, and 68,000 um, computers actually have to do this, they all do this, uh, is 
have the boot state of the machine map a ROM to where the reset vectors are, and then have the boot code immediately uh, trigger some hardware on your board to remap uh, the ROM into a different space. Um, and I highly doubt the NES has that kind of hardware on board. Um, it has its own V blank interrupt. Does it? Well, let's let's look it up. Um, NES dev. NES boot. Let's see, because I do not know. CPU power up state. Um, okay, so this is literally just. I mean, and this this. So two things. A, this page is literally uh, just what what is in the CPU registers when the thing turns on. Um, I like how it's saying CPU state, but it's talking about non-CPU registers. Um, I don't know if these are just because that's the default state of a 6502, or, well, this uh, Ryko version of the 6502 on power on reset. Um, but, yeah, you should not rely on the state of any registers after power up, and especially not the stack register and, and RAM, because they will be gooby the goop because they're not being initialized by anything. Um, let's look at that. Anyway, but that, that the fact that they have a page that tells you what the system state is at power up even that leads me to think you get whatever the reset hardware state is and have to handle it, which would indicate that there's not initialization. When the NES is powered on a reset, the program should do the following within a fixed bank. Um, yeah, it's telling you to like set up IRQs and everything. boot. You'd think this would be like a big deal. Like this is how you get software to start on the freaking thing. Um. Hi again. At least we had a nice long gap before uh, the connection went down again this time. Um. I'm still not really finding anything on Uh, you know, the startup process of this guy. Programming guide? Uh, let's look at tutorials, because if there is a boot vector in the tutorial, then. Okay, that's not very useful. That said, I was actually looking at a Hello World on GitHub earlier, and that should tell me. Source, helloworld.asm, and yes. So, of course, this person is using an assembler that where org actually pads things, but yeah, so at FFFA, it puts the uh, address of the NMI interrupt handler and the reset vector. So this is at FFFA, FFFB, and this is at FFFC, FFFD. So, the cart definitely has its own reset vector. So I don't know. Let me re let me look at chat because I haven't since I kind of started looking this up. But uh, 
I don't know what the story is there with the V-Blank thing. I don't know if you're just thinking, like, the NES has a V-Blank interrupt, but that is because the PPU has an interrupt line attached to the interrupt input of the CPU, so that on V-Blanks an interrupt fires, but as far as the handler, you have to insert a handler into the, the vector table. Um, yeah, let me, let me read. Uh, as far as I know, it needs interrupt vectors. Reset, NMI, and, and BRK, yeah. Um, it has its own V-blank interrupt. There's no way to have that without its own ROM. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Well, it's like, because, uh, not that there's default handling per se, but, again, because really the, the only comparable uh, console program that I've done so far is for the Genesis. And again, the Genesis does have a minimal onboard boot ROM, so it's not a crazy thought because that boot ROM actually does check some stuff in the in the header. Um, but it would appear the Genesis or the NES does not. Uh, so anyway, we have to pad this thing out. Um, how long have I been going? Because I don't want to go too long. Forty-eight minutes. Um, we may not get there. We may have to get there tomorrow. Let's at least try and make a a ROM that is padded out to 128k. Um, directives. A lot. Oh, might be able to use a line. Um, fill. Let's see. Fill the next n bytes using the value provided by the second argument. Um, so I can use this with a little math. Again, assuming we'll just have to see. If I if it if it only goes up 64k, I can write a quick quick script to like pad the front of the ROM with zeros. Um, but we'd have to do some quick math because I have to subtract some labels from each other. So uh, that'll be fill. Is it going to be fill FFFF minus the label? I don't know. It'll be easy to find out. So I build it, and it's got one too many bytes. Then there you go. Um, I'm still going to use my org, even though it's probably not necessary. It was a dot fill, and I've definitely used this before. But you know, using it live, all of a sudden there is nothing in your brain. Uh, fill, yeah, dot fill, dot fill. Then the number of things. Dot fill, and then I think I can do math. Um, oh, right, that's going to be FFFC minus. Uh, wait. My brain. Okay, so I actually want to put the fill because I'm putting. Uh, we're reconnecting and dis disconnecting again. Um, 1F. F A Oh my god. This math is so easy and I can't do it right now. Um I need to fill the number of bytes minus FFA O. Right? So that should be easy. So actually like I can let's just do that math in a calculator. Calculator. Um and then the really annoying thing is that I also have to well, do a fill. The Yeah, because this fill, I can just do the math on it. This fill, uh, I'd have to know. I'm going to have to, this place, I'm going to need to do some, some math. Like we'll do, eventually some code will go in here, but uh, end of code. Let's just put a label there. And then we will do dot fill. This is the place where I will need to do some math. This will be like one F F F C. Oh God, no, because it'll be the difference between F F A O. Oh, we could we could do this logically because if there was nothing in here, then this is F F A O, then nothing, and we will need to fill the difference between F F F C and F F A O, right? Um, yes. So I think it's end of code minus FFFC. No, other way around. 
FFFC minus end of code. And I don't know why I put a dollar sign in front of this. Okay, that seems rightish. Um, and we will fill that with zeros because who cares? And then I will just fill the end of this with all of the all three of the things. Um, so let's actually put this as FFFA and we will do word zero for the NMI, uh, word zero also for the BRK interrupt, and that should take us to the end of memory. And then theoretically we should be able to put some amount of code in here, and this should adjust itself automatically, hopefully. Uh, and now up here I have to, let me, let me pre-calculate this. It should, it would, there's the reconnect. Uh, right. So I could do this math in here, but it would be, uh, let's change this in a programmable way. And let's make sure we're in hex. So this is going to be uh, 1, or no, it'd be like 2. This is probably going to give me an off by 1 error. I don't know if anybody's saying anything in chat. I'm not even going to look until the end, and then I can go, yeah, you told me. Uh, so 20,000 hex minus FFAO is that, apparently. So let's fill 10060. Again, that's probably off by one. I will also fill that with zeros. So that should pad everything up to... I'll stick these here, even though those don't do anything. Uh, and actually, these would this would be correct, because if I'm just going to use org for... Uh, um, labels and whatnot. Oh no, but that's annoying because hmm hmm because up to this point oh pff, no, I'm really dumb. This would just be one FFA zero. Duh. Fill one FFA zero bytes and Because here's the thing, is this is going to be calculated based on uh, what what org is setting the program counter to at this point. So, eh. and that's that's a 16 byte value. So yeah, let's just f it. We'll just use 16 byte values everywhere. Um, this org is redundant. Uh, this needs to be changed to FFA. That org is also redundant, but hey, whatever. Um, so this should hopefully give us a 64k uh, image, and then I will just have to just have to pad it, and that is the way it is. Assembly failed. Don't give me that shit. Number or identifier expected. Clearly, I am mathing wrong. That that was this one, right? Uh, yes. End of cod. And yeah. So it's end of code and then this thing. Hmm. How do I math? What is the correct syntax for mathing? Oh, it's square brackets. This is going great. Not a curly bracket. Give me a square bracket. Ensemble. So we failed. Cool. Uh, non matching parentheses. So it doesn't like the fact that. Is it that there's a space in there? Let's find out. not a space in that example. Let's kill the space and see if it likes it any better. Yeah, it was that. 
Okay, so if I download this binary, it should give me a 64k binary, and there should be my vector at the end, and basically nothing else. For that guy. Yes, I would love to replace it. And let's inspect it. All right, that looks promising. Let me just make sure that the address range only goes to... Uh, okay, so it... The address range is for the device. Uh, does it have a jump to address that I'm missing? to address, I guess midway, oh, I'm doing all the scrolling, right in the F's and right at the tail end, we should have, yay, FF, A0, there's our boot vector, alright, that actually works properly, um, hopefully that will also work properly once I put some code inside of there, but that's a start. Let me check chat. Let me see what's going on over here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -boom. Doesn't NES cartridges have different hardware mappers that map things to whatever memory needs to be mapped for said games? Yes. And that's one of the things that I am subtly ignoring right now. The mapper on this cartridge that I'm using uh, I know it maps the end of the mask ROM to um, the end of NES space. There's a fixed chunk there. So that's what I'm relying on. That's also why I am shoving my, I'm putting my code right at FFA0 because uh, I can't remember how big that space is. So I'm just going to start writing my code at the end because I don't know how much space I have. Um, mm -hmm. There are a few online tutorials for the minimal NES ROM, as I found one on GitHub earlier. Um, uh, as far as, but they said on the address bus in the cart in front of the ROM's RAM. Um, kind of, yes, but actually, uh, it's it's interesting because I think uh, people who ha haven't necessarily messed with uh, hardware have this idea that that kind of thing like actually sits between stuff because that's the way it often looks in block diagrams. Um, it's actually, for example, I can tell you on these cards, like the data bus goes directly to the data pins on all of the chips. Um, and the low order address lines pretty much go to the low order address lines directly on all the chips. And then the mapper uh, is just looking at high order address lines and then it has a couple registers on there also to control some of the super high order address lines that don't actually exist, you know, ones above uh, the... Um, the, the 16th bit. We're reconnected. Uh, where was I in, in that thing? Anyway, uh, so it doesn't like actually sit on in front of the, it's not on the address and data bus. Um, it's on them, but it doesn't sit between them. It just uh, reads those lines and asserts a couple of control lines to uh, enable each of the chips. So um, yeah, bank, bank switching glue logic. Exactly. Um, let me see if there's anything else I'm missing. Reset vector FFFC needs to point to code at uh, 8000 to BFFF or C1000 to FFF. Um, can't you ignore the upper 64K? Just use the lower 64K and tie the upper address pin to ground. Uh, sure, that would just require more work on this adapter than I feel like doing. I've already done the minimal amount, so I'm just going to pad it. Um, not to backseat, but why not just use CC65? Uh, yeah, probably totally. I'm just using this because I don't, I haven't installed a um, assembler on here, and this was the fastest way to get up and running. Um, yeah, as far as using the mapper, uh, yeah, if you haven't seen any of the other videos, I just ripped apart a Super Mario Brothers 3 cartridge. So uh, the only thing that I've changed on there is I'm swapping out the mask ROM for, a, for an EEPROM um, and making it work. Okay, back to what we were doing. So, uh, all I want to do, like I was saying, is literally set the uh, the uh, 
like the strobe, that's what they're calling it. Set the strobe of the controller register, which again, are those shared? I'm not sure, let's check. Uh, this window, controllers. Here we go. Um, controller shift register strobe. So I'm only seeing one register here, so I assume the strobe is shared by both of the controllers. Maybe. I won't worry about that. If either of them are going high, then I'm fine with it. Um, yeah, while strobe is high, the shift registers in the controllers are loaded from the Latin states. Um, yeah, so I assume that is shared. I don't really care for these. Oh, wait, no, I, I do care because I would have cared if I was going to try and use the one controller to turn on and off the strobe pin on the other controller port, but I'm not doing that right now, so ignore. So if I, I should just be able to write a 1 to 4016, and that should turn the strobe bit on, and then I can sit in a halt loop, and it should be that easy. So let us... Uh, this guy. Literally... Um, let me let me do the right thing. Let me, let's see. Let me look back at that demo because I should turn off the IRQ so it doesn't go insane. Um, no, it wasn't over there. It was over here. Um, so SEI, SEI, and I guess I will clear decimal mode as well. Why not? I have I have a couple bytes to play around with. SEI and clear decimal flag and load a one store a four oh one six and uh, let's just call this end loop. It's also because fun fact the six oh shit. I think I just went back. Oh, it saved its state. Thank you, browser. Uh, yeah, so one of, the, one of the fun things about the 6502 is that it does not have a unconditional branch instruction. So uh, generally you clear carry and then branch carry clear and loop to do a uh, unconditional branch, which is stupid. Um, and I'm sure that's a, I'm sure I have enough lights. Let's see if my math actually mathed correctly. And let's call this one a strobe and halt. And let's look at that here. Let's load that one. Ooh, cool. I don't even have to write a like a a prepending thing here. Uh, I can just specify where in the buffer to start loading data. So that's good. Um, nice. Anyway, let's load strobe and halt dot bin. And that looks like some code. So at FFA zero, oh yeah, I have plenty of space here. Um, this looks like it would do something. And that looks like a halt loop, because I believe that's the opcode for branch carry clear, and that is negative, what, negative two? Um, to jump back to here, and then the uh, PC increments by one, so that that is the halt loop. So now the only question, let's, let's just friggin' do it. Um, let's do load file, let us start at offset, uh, one, no, nope, that is not, I want 10,000 x yes, and go for it, yes, and then that basically will fill the beginning with all Fs, and then the end of my ROM, cool, that's exactly what I wanted, so, uh, my chip's already in there, let us, let us write it, 
Uh, don't check the ID because for some reason that doesn't work. And program that bad boy. And of course, you know this isn't going to like work first try because um, it no, nothing ever does. Um, and it verified, so we are good to try this. Um, you know what I want to do? You know what I want to do? Because we have to do this anyway. Let's keep the anticipation on that one. Um, I want to... I have NES controllers around here somewhere. And let me grab one. And... Oh, it's right here next to me. Let us yank this open. That is one one thing that I did do off screen earlier, just because I was impatient. Uh, is I already pulled one of these open because I don't think I've opened an NES controller before, uh, and I wanted to see how the cable affixes to the PCB in there, because I was hoping it would you know be like a a plug and socket type situation, and it is not, and that is annoying. But because I you know I, you can probably get uh, like a reproduction. Uh, connectors, I would imagine, but I don't have the time or patience for that, um, and I'm too foolish to do something that straightforward. So, in the interest of trying to do as little damage to my existing hardware as possible, um, I will probably just, I'm thinking, desolder the cable from one of these controllers, and then at least I can solder it back in. Uh, to get a controller back, and it won't be completely ruined, and it will be totally reversible, is my thought and hope. Um, so this is this is the PCB for an NES controller, and as you can see, they are literally just soldered into the board, which is super cool. Um, so reconnected. Uh, let me start by checking to see which one of these wires is the latch wire. Um, assuming I can get a probe in here, maybe, and uh, pop that one out and um, like a, just attach an LED to it for now so that we can keep resetting the, the console a bajillion times and adjusting the cart slightly um, until it works. Let's just use a jumper wire. Oh, man. I've also already forgotten the uh, in out. Okay, it was opposite side of the chamfer, second from the bottom. Yes. Of course, it's not that one. Of course, it's not that one. Of course, it's not that one. Is it that one? That one? No, I'm just not making good contact here. use that to make my life marginally easier. Oh, I should probably put this on resistance mode, because I don't have continuity mode. Get get over it. Uh, is it that first one? No, it looks like it's orange. Yep, it is the orange one. Let's desolder it. I mean, I guess I might as well just desolder these all while I'm here. Why not? I will need to do it anyway. And then I can put the PCB back with the body of the controller where it belongs. And thankfully, you might think I'm just going totally totally nuts here and won't remember how these go back. Uh, the board is labeled, which is pretty nice. Pretty nice, Nintendo. Way to go. Mm, the smell of old solder. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. It's like the smell of old electronics, like, multiplied by two. Okay, I said it was the orange one, right? Is that what we said?
to let me be lazy and I'm just going to solder directly to it. Uh, I will also need ground, which is, I remember, that's the top one. I think that was white. And I already threw away my multimeter. Getting ahead of myself. White? Maybe. Nope. Not yellow. Brown? Red? Am I just not making good connection? Brown, maybe? Maybe? Yeah, it looks like brown. Tis brown. Okay. Orange and brown. Nice 70s colors. Now we can get rid of multimeter. everything off my desk in the process and uh, oh I have it's weird being semi-organized I actually like got a parts organizer and I know where everything is and that is a really alien feeling to me and it's a little uncomfortable you know what for shits and giggles let's pop two on here let's put one between five volts and ground uh, these are I got these at Radio Shack uh, when they were going out of business and they were super cheap. Uh, they have inline resistors. They are so helpful. They make stuff so easy. Like, they're great for just testing. Highly recommended. Okay, so... Let's get some fresh solder on the ground pin. noise. And I think these already have solder on them, maybe? I'm just going to twist these together like a lazy person. And put my hand right in front of the camera, I'm sure. Ow, I can burn my fingers, and that seems good enough. Okay, and then I am going to solder one of them to the strobe connection. Alligator clips also would have worked perfectly fine here, um, but I'm a maniac. And if you can solder, why not solder, you know? Because it's fun. There we go. I know, I know you couldn't see me do that, but trust me, I really did it. Oh. And we're back. And 5 volt is the one right on the bottom corner of the chamfer. Of course, I got rid of the multimeter again. Should be that guy. And of course, it would be too simple for red to be 5 volt. That would make too much sense. Is it white? It is white. OK. I'm not going to pick you up again. I'm not going to do it. Fresh solder. Solder, as they say. And now I'll have kind of a sanity check light so that that should turn on anytime I turn on the console. Because I always need a constant check on my sanity. Come on. I just need I just need a little garbage solder job. That's all I need from you. Oh, come on. Why will you not adhere? Bro. You can't see what's going on. That's dumb. I'm just not giving enough time to cool down and it's very hot. There, that seems connected. 
All right, so let's just do a basic sanity check. And I was going to say it's very bright, but maybe if I do that, that should work fine. But I should be able to plug this in, and uh, one of the lights should just turn on, and one of the and, and the other one should not. Ta-da. There you go. So now comes the part where I plug in my cartridge, oh, where I plug my newly programmed EEPROM into my ludicrous stack and hope and, and press really hard and hope that all of the connections are connected and jam it into the NES and pray and jiggle and pray and jiggle and pray until that LED comes on. Try not to break any of the pins. Okay, and press it in there good and tight in the hopes that that will somehow help the connections not suck. Okay, let's I guess put this. How can I make this the most dramatic looking? Does that work? Can I put these in the shadow of the NES and make it work for me? Sure. Why not? That seems doable. Okay. Um, are you guys ready for this jelly? Because I'm not sure if you're ready for this jelly. Because I am not ready for this jelly. Well, let me look at chat before we go crazy. Um, oh, wh why uh, just use jump for unconditional branch? Um, uh, jump it uses a full 16-bit address. So, I mean, you know, it's a question of why not, but it requires, like in this in this particular case, there is absolutely no reason not to just use a jump. But uh, jump uh, reads a full 16-bit address out of RAM, so it requires two memory access cycles, whereas a branch only requires one. Um, so that's the difference, because uh, branch is relative. So if you're doing a little tight loop, you would really prefer to use branch over jump. And that's just why I need to use branch. I'm not like a great 6502 programmer or anything. Um, I'd try to get it to execute a NOP in a loop first. Yes, but then how do I know that it's doing it? Gotcha. Gotcha. Caught um, Is there anything else good in here? The MMC1 will complicate your memory map a bit. Yes, it is actually an MMC3. Um, that much we have done a little bit of research on. Um, yeah, it's not It's not uh, Super Mario Brothers. It's Super Mario Brothers 3. Um. <laughs> Who needs unconditional branch when you can just reset condition? That is a fact. Um, oh, see you procrastinate. You're going to miss the best part. Or, you know, maybe nothing will happen. Um, just say beep out loud for continuity. I like it. I like it very much. I'm never going to get a proper meter with a continuity mode. I'm just going to use resistance mode forever and say beep when it's pretty low. Um, all right. I see. Oh, oscilloscope on the address pins. Yeah. Yeah, well, I also have a logic probe over here, so... Or not a logic probe, an actual... I have a logic analyzer, uh, which would make this all very easy to do, but that is not uh, why I'm here. Um, okay. Grip it and rip it. Wow, look, it didn't work. Adjust and reset. Adjust and reset. And after we do this several times... Well, the next time we're just... There you go. There you go. Gotcha. Bam! How good is that? We got them both on. We got them both on. It works just fine. Maybe. Actually, it is interesting because this is... One of them looks... Oh, no, it's just, like, on camera. I think it's just the angle. Uh, one of them looked a little dimmer on camera, but they are not dimmer in person. So I was wondering if it was toggling or something. But, no, it's on. Uh, and if I don't adjust anything... Let me make sure these are fairly visible. 
If I hit the reset button, it should just do it again. Ho ho! Boys, girls, they's, them's, my dears and queers. Fuck yeah. All right. A uh, little over an hour, but I am I am quite chuffed with that, that I managed to make my little rerouting IC uh, uh, chip carrier, whatever. The, I couldn't remember this last time either. Why can't I... IC socket. Uh, managed to build that. Managed to build a little test controller rig thing here. Managed to uh, program an IC. Hell yeah, guys! So I think next time we'll be more code. Um, trying to get the PPU to do something. But, uh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Now for the dual port ramp. Uh, oh, you know, let's let's do a, a mild outro here. Um, only because uh, I said when I did like the intro video for this whole series um, that this guy was going to make a comeback, and this guy is not here. Where did I put it? Um, the the newest video card project. Where the hell did I put that thing? Well, it doesn't matter if you've watched the channel at all. Uh, you know what it is, and if you have not watched the channel at all, then that gives you a reason to go back and, and watch that video. Um, I'm thinking I might strap it to the Genesis when we get there. I feel like that could maybe make sense. Because, um, I don't know, Genesis seems like a cool thing to have a GUI on. And I'm going to try and get uh, UC Linux running on the Genesis when we get there is one of the one of the scope of the projects for that one. So... Uh, I believe that there is a X server for UC Linux, and if I could get UC Linux on the Genesis uh, outputting semi-decent resolution graphics on that video card, because the Genesis is graphics card. Graphics card? It's, it's video chip is not really built to do like a linear frame buffer like that, so it would not work that great, but it'd be an interesting hardware product. So, uh, yeah. How to make a $200 USD console shine a light in an hour. Hard difficulty. That's this channel, baby. And I think that is the perfect note to uh, get out of here while I'm on a high note. See you guys maybe tomorrow. We'll see if I can keep this up.